I would like to start by thanking now for inviting me. And I would also like to thank Stephen Phillips for looking at the slides earlier and for correcting a partial mistake of mine. I would like to talk about a topic that's totally out of my wheelhouse. And I would like to explain why I think it's an interesting topic in the context. So this right here is a slide that I took from one of Nao's recent talks where he is showing one of the key ideas of his that inspired me that there should be isomorphic relationships between both certain kinds of abstractions from brain activity, so information structures shown here at the bottom of two people, person A and person B, and the qualia structure of each of these people. So the curly versions of the equal sign, they denote isomorphism. So there should be isomorphic relationships all around. And so if that's true, I denote isomorphisms here in green, then that means what we're actually dealing with is isomorphisms between certain mathematical structures that we call hypergraphs. I denoted the hypergraphs here in purple, and I will explain a little bit more what hypergraphs are in a moment. But what I'm interested in is that once we reach this point in consciousness science that we can describe the qualia structure of people and we can connect that to the information structure from their brain activity, we run into a question, which is how do we know they're isomorphic? That is the topic of my talk today. I'm interested in finding out how we can compute isomorphisms between hypergraphs. My goals are to first explain exactly why somebody like me, who mostly spends his time looking at brain activity and neural data, is interested in these kinds of very mathematical questions. I very much would like to get feedback from everybody. In fact, I try to be provocative in some of the things that I present. So I hope to trigger discussion and maybe also inspire other people who have no ideas. And lastly, I hope that maybe more people find out that I'm wrong and that I made mistakes. And that's because I'm not trained formally in mathematics. I'm a neuroscientist. And so as I said, this is out of my wheelhouse. It's possible that I got things wrong and I would like to know. When you go to PubMed and you look at the neuroscientific literature and you look at keywords such as graph and brain, you find that there's thousands, in fact, seven and a half thousand roughly results that have been produced. And that's because graph theory has been really successful in neuroscience. So this right here is a figure from a recent paper that I took that shows the overall approach. And the idea quite simply is that we can take different kinds of brain data. So on the left-hand side, anatomical data, on the right-hand side, functional data. And we can express these data in terms of graphs. And if you just visually look at these graphs, it kind of looks like a brain or what our understanding is of a brain and that we think of the brain as a network, as nodes, if you will, or vertices that are connected and interact. And so that would be the edges of a graph. Well, my point that I wanna make today is that that is actually not what the brain does. So a graph by definition is binary, expresses binary relations, which is that there's only one line between two points. So in other words, there's one edge between two nodes or two vertices. But in neuroscience, we actually deal with something that's more complex. And I tried to show this here symbolically with this diagram where they're showing the idea of a heavy and synapse. What I'm showing here is the inputs x1, x2 to xn. So these might be all different neurons onto another neuron. That's the circle in the middle. And that circle produces an output, Y. So typically the way that we think about it is that what neurons do is that they get a variety of inputs, in this case, X1, X2 until Xn, and they sum these inputs up. And if they cross a certain threshold, then they provide an active output. So that's the idea of an integrated fire neuron. The other thing that's shown right here is these Ws, W1, W2, and so on. Those would be the synaptic strengths, if you will, or how much the inputs are weighed for all of these different neurons that are providing input to that one neuron. Well, what you can see here already is 
that instead of just having a one-to-one -one relationship with a node, we're dealing here with many different edges. There's more than one edge. There's many nodes and they all come together. The thing that concerns me though, is that each of these arrows right here is still just a binary relationship. It only symbolizes the impact of a single neuron in isolation. But when it comes to neuroscience, we know that there's more going on. So I'm showing right here a simplified version of this graph to make it a little bit more simple. I cleaned it up. So we only have X1 and let's say X2 as another input neuron. And they both converge. They both provide inputs to the neuron that we're interested in that produces the output Y. And I'm showing right here data from a nature paper that was published by Clay Reed's lab with Marty Asri and Jose Manuel Alonso where they ran across a very rare instance where they got lucky enough to record three neurons at the same time in the brain of an animal that were all connected. So what I'm showing right here at the top, A and B are receptive fields of two neurons that are in the thalamus of an animal, and the neuron C is in the visual cortex. And what we know about the anatomy of the brain is that Neurons A and B, when they're connected to neuron C, they must converge. It's pretty much the same situation that I'm showing on the left-hand side. So you can think of X1 as A and X2 as B, and these neurons are firing. And when they fire, they provide inputs onto neuron C. So what I'm showing below these blue dots, which show the receptive fields are cross correlations. And they indicate that when each of these neurons is active, with a little bit of a delay, which we expect because there is a synapse in between, neuron C gets active. So that is a pretty strong evidence that these neurons have a causal impact onto neuron C. Well, the interesting thing is that if we look at the pairwise relationship, so we look at the isolated input or the effect that A has on C and that B has on C, we can also ask, well, what happens if both fire at the same time? And so that's showing right here in the middle. So when A and B are active at the same time, it turns out that neuron C also gets active, but we cannot predict how. Isolated activity of neuron A and of neuron B, if we know the causal impact of each, does not allow us to predict or find out quantitatively what the combined activity of both of them is. So when both neurons are active, A and B, something happens that is close to emergent, something new happens, something that cannot be described just by studying the pairwise relations. There's a tertiary relationship between these neurons. And that is exactly what hypergraphs are all about. So what I'm showing right here, again, are three nodes, N, 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 N. And the traditional way of thinking about a graph would be shown in blue, where we can connect a, a line or an edge between individual nodes. But what I just showed you is that what happens in the brain is that when two neurons are active at the same time, they combine their effect. And that would be shown right here with the black lines where the two edges, if you will, from the nodes combine and provide a new combined input onto the third node. And that is what we call a hyper edge. And whenever we're dealing with hyper edges, we're dealing with hyper graphs. So if we take this example from before, the edge would be that we're studying each of the causal effects of these neurons onto the cortical neuron in isolation. But what the Nature paper showed is there's a combined effect that we have to investigate as a hyper edge. Now, hyper edges can also be thought of or shown and graphed in different ways. So this is a different way to think of a hypergraph where each of the letters here, the circles A, B, and so on, those are different nodes. And then what you see in colors, what kind of looks like rubber bands that stretch between them are hyper edges. Each time that you see here a hyper edge that spans more than two nodes, so the green would be a, a regular edge in a graph, but then the blue and the orange rubber bands, they show you that there is a non-pairwise relationship. It's a hyper edge. But if you look into PubMed and you type in hypergraph and neurons, you only get eight results. Hypergraph and brains, only 48 results. So what I'm telling you is that even though we've studied the brain a lot and we've been using graph theory, when it comes to what might be the most fitting type of graph theory, namely to generalize the hypergraphs, there's almost nothing done yet. And hypergraphs are also interesting for when 
this, this idea of looking at brain activity that might give rise to qualia structure, in particular, integrated information theory. So this is just a summary of integrated information theory that many of you might be familiar with. And it basically shows a hypergraph, which is that when we're talking about the cause effect structure or the CES that neurons are creating that ultimately provide a structure, a mathematical structure that is isomorphic to the qualia structure. Well, that structure is a hypergraph. In the language of IIT, it is described as a simplicial complex. And I'm showing this at the bottom, but also for you that are not familiar with that, a simplicial complex in a way is a special kind of hypergraph where you start by having a zero simplexes. So those were the individual nodes. You can have a one simplex, which would be the edge in a regular graph between them. And the two simplex would be like a triangle shown right here. And that is basically identical to what I showed before, the hyper edge in a hypergraph where you have the combined influence add on one thing. The only difference here, it's, it's not directed as I did before. It's, it's an undirected graph. And simplicial complexes are related to hypergraphs. There's ways to translate between them. They're not the same though. I will probably come back to this topic later. There's certain benefits to stick to hypergraphs when it comes to this kind of data. There's certain benefits to simplicial complexes as well, but we're still kind of dealing with the same thing. Okay, so an implicial complex is a type of hypergraph. So there you go, hypergraphs are important. So when we look at the isomorphism between certain qualia structures, which are hypergraphs, or we expect them to be hypergraphs and brain activity from say IIT, that such as uh, simplicial complexes, so should be hypergraphs. So we should find ways to compute isomorphisms between them. Okay, now when you do a literature search, if you answer, try to answer the question to compute whether two hypergraphs are isomorphic, it turns out that there's very recent papers and there's increased interest in solving it. And it doesn't seem to be an easy issue. So solving the hypergraph isomorphism problem, there's different solutions. And what I wanna talk about today is that maybe category theory as a different way of thinking about it might help us to find even more solutions to this question that ultimately will be at the end of this approach of trying the quality structure approach. Now, if you look into what software exists for hypergraphs, so I put a slide in here of something that I'm actively working on right now, on the left-hand side, these are different part of Cortex. We're basically partnering the brain into three parts so I can start constructing a hypergraph. But I looked into the software and that's showing on the right. There's not that many packages available yet. So one of them is called Hypernet X and I'm showing this here on the right-hand side. It was developed by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And it's basically a Python toolbox that allows you to look into hypergraphs. There's a rival project shown right here. Again, it's a Python toolbox called HCX. And what it allows you to do, both of these packages in different ways, is to draw hypergraphs, to translate them between simplicial complexes and so on. But neither of these packages, and as far as I know, these are the only existing packages, even though they're actively under collaboration, allow you, for example, to look at directed hypergraphs. So there's still a lot of work to do, it seems, for the entire field to get to this point, which might be relevant for this research program. Now, there's things you can do in the meantime that might not require directed hypergraphs, such as the idea of two neurons giving combined input onto a third neuron. And so I'm showing this just here briefly, that there is very active research. Most of these papers are from the last two years where you could, for example, look at how qualia structure changes over time or how brain activity ch changes over time. And we can express that as simplicial complexes or hypergraphs and there's already a lot to learn there before you even start to make assumptions about causality and direction of these edges. A uh, question that some of you might have at this point is, how not this all the same as topological data analysis, TDA, which is a very hot topic right now, especially in neuroscience. So I put here a p and paper that just came out a week or two ago by Marlene Cohen and colleagues, where they describe how they're using their neuronal data and the topological data analysis to find new insights. And they did very fine, very interesting insights about brain activity and how this works. But the point is, if you look at what they do in topological data analysis, which yes, is a way of finding hypergraphs of looking at simplicial complexes, 
the way that these are constructed ultimately is still relying on pairwise interaction. So this right here is the actual text from one of the figures, and I just highlighted in color that the trick of moving from pairwise interactions of pairwise edges to an hyper edge is done in that approach by coming up with a way to infer or considering that there is a higher order interaction, but it all starts out with a pairwise interaction. So this right here is actually the input to a typical TDA or topological data analysis. And it's a two dimensional matrix, matrix because these are the input to TDA ultimately is pairwise. And so it doesn't allow for what I would argue is the interesting part about IIT that I'm interested in, and also that might be the most interesting for qualia structure, which is that we move beyond pairwise interactions to higher order interactions, so trinary and beyond. So what about category here? Why did I stumble into it? Well, there are, of course, papers that talk about category theory and hypergraphs, and there are very close links. So this right here is just a slide that I stole that says that I like a lot that category theory is not about doing things that you could not do before. It is about understanding things that you did not understand before. So I stole it from a talk by Evan Pedersen. And I put at the top a diagram that shows that when we look at certain, let's say, commutative diagrams of category theory, we end up with what looks like a hypergraph. So there seems to be already a connection there that I find interesting. And so I hope that maybe by applying category theory, maybe we can learn something by looking at things differently that we didn't see before. And I started out by looking at monoidal categories and monoids, and that's probably just because they're very hot topic right now. And as you might know, a monoid is a set with a unit element and an associative, so a, a binary operation. And that's interesting because basically the very simple mathematical objects with which we can do a lot of things that they're very simple atoms, if you will, that you can construct a lot of more complex molecules out of. So the issue though, is that they are fundamentally based on binary operations. So when I looked more into what you can do with monoids and monoidal categories, I stumbled upon these beautiful diagrams, these string diagrams, such as the Frobenius monoids here, and they show something quite interesting, which is that, well, yeah, in the end, when you combine more than three things at a time, what you're dealing with ultimately is still binary. So any of these branches that you see right here, there's always two coming together and joining. There's never three coming together. And that is, of course, because binary operations are the heart of that. So this is all still based on pairwise combination. And so that is interesting, I think, because if you look into what is, has been made out of monoids, and why that's so interesting, is that basically you end up at the point that all of arithmetic, in a way, is based on binary operations. And so, for example, uh, it took me a while to really hammer this out, but when we do addition, then there's no way to mechanically or computationally do it other than involving pairwise operations. So even when it comes to a computer, uh, there's certain parts of adding binary numbers where you can do more than binary operations at a time, but in the end, there's always end gates involved where you have to break it down into binary operations. So there's something very fundamental about keeping things pairwise. So when it comes to these monoids, it almost seemed like I was stuck, but then I, I did find out that there are, of course, also diagrams in category theory where it seems that you have combinations that are non-pairwise where more things are coming together. And it made me think a lot about why is this that the, the pairwise combination is so predominant. And I know this is more philosophy probably than mathematics, but wherever I looked, I found that it's the, the pairwise structure that popped up again and again and again. Maybe that is what is holding us back in a way to uh, move on to a full understanding of especially directed pinograms. So, at some point, I ran into Yoda, who said there's always two, no more, no, no less. And even when it comes to hypergraphs, there's a way to look at the same hypergraph shown here to the left, where you see the familiar way of looking at hyperedges that combine more than two nodes, where you can represent it in a pairwise manner, in a bipartite graph, where you're, again, creating this duality of basically putting the edges, the hyperedges to one side, and all of the nodes to the other side. So that those are equivalent 
isomorphic representations of what a hypergraph does. So there's some irony that even when you move to hypergraphs, you end up with this pairwise relationship again. And so one thought that I had right here is that maybe that is due because whenever we stick to finite things, and so it looks like from what we understand, most in the universe is finite. So there's a minimal amount of length, for example, there's a maximal amount of length. And then whenever you have something, a spectrum, even if it's continuous in between, there's an, a beginning and an end, you, you end up with poles, you end up with this kind of duality. So maybe that is one of the reasons why pairwise relations are so frequent in nature. Now, I did look around a lot and I did find some examples where it seems to be that certain natural processes, certain reactions in chemistry, they are fundamentally non-binary, non-pairwise. And so here's one of the chemical reactions, even though I'm not a chemist, I got help from AI helping me with this, I don't fully trust it. But AI told me that there's some chemical reactions where you have to have three agents come together at the exact same time, or the reaction doesn't happen. So you cannot do this trick of the monoidal um, arithmetic, where you take pairwise combinations and you just chain them up, uh, behind each other to combine more than two things. And then I also came across the fact that octonians are non-associative. So that my understanding is also means that you cannot apply this trick where if you add three numbers that you basically just break it down into pairwise operations. And lastly, a very simple example would be the motor in every car where you have to have fuel oxygen and an ignition spark all happen at the exact same time for the motor to ignite and to work. So this is a good example, I think, for where you have a real trinary, non-pairwise interaction. You cannot break it down into pairwise interactions. If you have just the fuel and just the air or just the air and just the ignition, if these two things happen and one happens later, you do not get the effect. So there are certainly processes in nature, I think the brain isn't the only one, where we have to move beyond pairwise mathematics to understand what is going on. Okay, so what I learned, and again, this is far beyond my wheelhouse, is what I'm actually interested in is colored operats, where we can move beyond binary operations to nary, so trinary and so on, non-pairwise higher order interactions. So those are multi-categories that allow for that. But from what it seems to me, this is also maybe, and another question, for example, is if there is this isomorphic relationship between brain hypergraphs, the causal structure of brain activity and qualia, another question that arises for me is, are brain information structures or cause effect structures and qualia all different algebras of the same operand or not? So these are all questions that I just want to throw out, see if uh, those even make any sense. And so with that, I thank everybody for the attention now again for inviting me to this talk. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, that's an uh, excellent talk. Uh, very tense, but uh, now, nah, um, there is, is there any comments? Uh, 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 wait, uh, Yuta. Yuta probably is the first. Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. So um, thank you, Alex. It was really interesting. And I agree that we need to think about the hy hyper edge or hypergraph. And um, you have been talking about only the neural activity, but are you expecting a hypergraph of behavior? And if so, what kind of you know uh, effect we should expect? So yeah, my understanding is that the assumption at least of IT is that there's an isomorphism between the cause effect structure that comes from the brain activity. And in IIT, that is already a hypergraph. It's a simplicial complex. So since it's isomorphic, I would expect that that basically means a qualia structure has to be a, a, a hypergraph as well. So, um, and again, I think it's interesting because all of the examples of relationship between let's say qualia structure and brain activity that we have so far such as color space, maybe the, the helix of listening to musical notes, how it comes out the same way, face space and so on. Those don't seem to be hypergraphs at the point uh, where we're dealing with that. So yeah, I think that's another interesting question. What doesn't that mean that at the end, qualia structure should be more than uh, pairwise when we describe it? I see, yeah, thank you. Uh, Alex, uh, it's actually kind of interesting that uh, yesterday we had a philosopher uh, who pointed out that you know when we are making some kind of a 
uh, discrimination or uh, comparison between the two objects. It's not just like the relationship between one and two that we are going to be investigating, but it's actually me, which is a kind of implicit in this you know, discrimination that is originating as a point of this other. So it is already like a you know, trial. Now this, me looking at that, and then there is this uh, you know, interaction. So this similarity judgment itself is also a kind of a hyper edge. Things and then looking at one, looking at one, doesn't have this similarity. But I think Yota, you want, your idea is actually interesting, but uh, even the simple discrimination or comparison is really I've never thought about it. Mm -hmm. But if so, you know, in the end, we need to, you know, kind of quantify the relationship, right? And what you are saying is that we can only focus on hyper edge or hyper graph, and we can't, you know, have the, the standard, you know, graph edge, like a pairwise in behavior. Yeah, but also it kind of makes um, explicit this you know, problematic um, or interesting kind of assumption that that. Each individual difference, uh, any different individual has a different kind of similarity judgment about the same object as well, right? Mm. It's because the starting point is already different. The resulting, you know, hyperage is also different, but they based on the, the starting point. Mm. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, two, the two things I find interesting is that my what struck me is because so much of mathematics is based on binary operations, that much of our intuition may be based off that as well. And that as we start to explore higher order interactions, trinary interactions to move beyond, let's say Pearson correlations and, and these very simple binary relationships that our intuition, that we might discover a lot that our where our intuition might also fail us. So, um, I find it interesting that even though that, that there's a lot of work on hypergraphs, it really seems to be in its infancy. And some of the interesting questions, such as moving towards causality and direction graphs, there's, there's, it's even a little bit unclear how we visualize those, let alone what we can compute with those. So one thing that's interesting that I learned that, that people do when they study hypergraphs is, for example, you can you can reduce hyper edges to regular edges. So you reduce the hypergraph to a regular graph, and then you see, does it make any difference? You can basically quantify this way to some degree if, if you're actually really dealing with the hypergraph. So that, that might be very baby steps, first steps so we can start to explore as we're moving into this, maybe actually somewhat unexplored realm. That sounds like uh, what I would teach you to quantify, right? Like, um, right. Okay. To be treated as a graph, and in some way, mm -hmm. and then how much do we lose, and in what way? That's something like a uh, no, computation by integrated information. Mm -hmm. If I ask, yeah, that, it's a kind of you know, uh, independent, I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What they do, what they do, what I've seen is that they go, for example, they start, let's say, at, at uh, uh, you know, I, I like words, a hyper edge that spans five nodes, right? So you only stay at that five, fifth dimension, and then you reduce those and see what happens. And then you do it with four interactions between four nodes, and then you do it between three until, so you can basically stagger it as a function of what level of interaction you're looking at. So, um, but yeah, it, it's very similar to IIT's approach of quantifying causality. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. I was growing this important perspective. I basically agree with you with the point that we have high order interactions. And uh, but there's also the reason why mathematics seems to be focus on binary is because what you really need to iterate. So you just say if you want to get ternary products. For example, even even functions you have ternary right uh, functions. And but, I mean there are, it, it's because there's an equivalence between treating the say the ternary product as a product between uh, a variable and a pair of things. So it, it, 
because of their equivalence relationship. The reason why, in a lot of sense, in some sense, you don't really need to go high because you just sort of get the kind of induction that we want to build around. Um, or even, even category three, when we talk about products, binary products, but really standard generalization, integrating the products, take product A and product X rather than just two of them. Uh, and that, that sort of, that sort of uh, common thing, even in category three, uh, higher category three, uh, most of them combine themselves to two categories, but you can go up to three categories of common scope. And, and, or another group, and I get to get to your real point about the interaction. Uh, this is a common problem in relational database. Well, whether you, whether or not your table should be a ternary relation, a binary relation, so on so forth. And the way to do that is look at its splitability. <coughs> this is a classic result, a classic uh, issue in relational database theory. You could just start a mass table or n variables, a relation of one table with n column. But that, that usually it's what they try to do is take them to what's called the normal forms, small set of sports relations. Let's take the ternary case for example. Now, if the if the ternary relation has what's called a unary key, that means you can index every row of the relation by a, uh, a single value in the column, then that uh, is necessarily splittable into two binary relations. So that gives you a way of determining the, the actual measure of interaction. It can split and recover the original relation. And not all, not all relations can do that, but again, the new relation requires two columns to index all, all rows, then it can't be split. The test of that is if what you do is you split the term into two binaries and try to rejoin it. And the rejoin relation is not the same as the original relation, uh, then it's not splitable. So you have a higher than relation. Uh, it is, it is to be well known. And, and, and to go back to your other Go back again to your point why they focused on binary. Uh, in, in relational databases, do that. Then in that situation, you can't. Now, you can come. Uh, so if you just retrieve the two binary relations, you lose information. But the way around that is um, to treat one of the related, uh, uh, it'll treat the binary relations as a high order binary relation, meaning that it's a relation between uh, one variable on one side and on the other side is actually a binary relation. You can't just call nested relations. And this is an nested idea. <laughs> This is why this is how you can move from hyper graphs to ordinary graphs by having special nodes which are themselves composed of eddies. Normally, it's ordinary directly graphs. Nodes are just simple nodes. But and you can have this sort of way you get a hyper graph as a sort of directly graph is a trick. It's that special nodes whose uh, contents is themselves are uh, themselves edges. And this gets back to this equivalent. Uh, in, uh, this is a common uh, the classic example, of course, is called currying in computer science. We take a binary function condition and create and turn it into a unary relation, a unary hybrid, a unary uh, operation that itself returns another operation. Uh, and in category three, this is called the um, exponential transpose. It, it's a, a, a joint function between the product function. Uh, exponential point from the other side. And, 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 and even beyond that, for example, when we talk about uh, functions, we talk about binary, uh, bivariate functions, uh, trivariate functions. And when we talk about uh, natural transformations, the issues may look very functions, which is very, we can also talk about dynamic transformations. And then there are, for example, when we talk about the limits, we the next one, we're talking about ends, coexists, and stuff. So it's all in there. It just, Piercing and hidden. And then, to your point, it does. There is a there is an interesting point that you make. Is that even though it's in there formally, uh, psychologically, it, particularly in newcomers, especially that I had I had this problem a lot. Is when you look at a variable, particularly in category, you look at a variable and say, ah, okay, that is the variable ratio. It's assuming things like the numbers or energies, but actually that variable is itself is quite complex. For example, uh, you can think of a binary. For example, often category groups say, okay. Let's take this, this um, category, but it, it may itself be a, a, a partition product or a set, and it may itself be a product set. And, then, and, some, and so, if, if you just look at the, the symbols, uh, you probably psychologically be disposed to thinking this is just a symbol. But actually, in fact, that, that might mean something more general. 
And I just don't tell you about it. So you come up a brick wall and I'm wondering why I don't understand this because there's this hidden assumption here that uh, this variable can actually rank into the more complex simply given a set of complex set of terminal variables. All very good stuff. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, it's very interesting. Can you hear? Um, yeah. One point is um, how to quantitative uh, quantitative study and the collective quantitative study and the qualitative study. One idea is to use the notion cumulus cumulus. Uh, do you know some? No, uh, notion of the generalization of variance is called cumulus or cumulus. C U M U L A N T. Never, never heard that. Yeah. Uh, this is very natural uh, concept in statistics. Uh, consider that, for example, the random variance X Y Z. If these are uh, independent, it's very uh, easy to calculate the covariance because it's not zero. And uh, but uh, if uh, this has some interaction, in intrinsic interaction, the covariance may be not zero uh, at least there. But uh, there is this is pairwise interaction, which is measured by covariance. But uh, there is a split side force or something. Uh, the generalization of cumulus, uh, called cumulus. And uh, this uh, detects the three times uh, relationship or four times relationship. And this kind of uh, uh, framework is also valid in even in normal commutative uh, probability, which contains um, as a subset uh, quantum theory or something. So you can find in the quantum field theory uh, textbooks that many. A kind of hyperbolics uh, for the distribution or interaction of elementary particles or something. So maybe the uh, using the notion of cumulus is very interesting approach to connect with your qualitative uh, 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 to present and qualitative uh, studies, uh, mathematical studies of something and uh, uh, more quantitative. And also, I think that seven years or eight years ago, I insist that cumulus is very important in IIT studies in uh, uh, some only covers. I'm not I'm a fighter's year, but I'm a, now it's a lot. Uh, interestingly, cumulus, uh, especially in non computative context, is um, a research. By in terms, of, I think we said for monoidal theory or something. So maybe that connection is very interesting for this. So we take it down. This is part of the comment. Then the second comment is more conceptual. That I think the uh, origin of uh, binality is uh, we are in process and process at beginning and ending. So some kind of gen. Primitive uh, time for life structure or causal structure is a kind of origin of binary because, uh, so I think the unification of this uh, strategy is can be found in dialectic hyper. Uh, as you mentioned in your talk, also the direct, not uh, non directed hyper, direct hyper is more natural for me. It has. Some aspects of binality like the and the anti and also it has a basic uh, relationship uh, between one. So I think that the directed study uh, um, natural and it is also because it's about pattern of something. So I think that yeah, your point is. Unified to say unified binary and non binary thing. It is very much a quick question. Um, so, in the case of direct in the hyperground, mm -hmm. 
if it's a diagram, uh, diagram, mm -hmm. uh, diagram that now um, I understand that like this is direction and this direction, right? Or this two. Mm -hmm. And then if we have three, then those can be me, and then I play yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. That's one, two, three. Yeah, yeah. So, I and Steve can be a source. Yeah. And it's I can be a source. Yeah. And another three. Yeah, yeah. So just think about three. Mm -hmm. Then there's a six behind mm -hmm. the In the passion, yeah. passion yeah. high five. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, this, this kind of thing, yeah. you can bring the painting by the eye. I think it is essential because uh, your example in the neuroscience and the chemical reactions has an uh, uh, apparently uh, obvious uh, the direction. Chemical reaction has a direction. So it's not just a uh, direct indication. So, and also the information is means some kind of direction also. And also the non binary kind. It is quite natural. And other it is also easy to connect to the cutting itself because it has some domain kind of okay. Is there any question or comments? If so, then I yeah, it's also difficult, but one well, thing I wanted to say is that um, what Steve said, um, this relational database and with the tertiary uh, kind of uh, situation, it's it's basically like an Excel sheet, right? Where it's um, filled in partially or sometimes in all corner or for each of the line. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, different culture, the different sheet. Uh, it, it, it's the thing of it, it hurts. For psychologists, think of it as one way of this two way interaction, three way interaction. Mm -hmm. so it's not, it's somewhat independent of whether or not they feel the, it's the, for example, uh, take for example, uh, or all, all three way combination, let's say A, B, and C. Um, if A, I'm oh, sorry. Approach to draw it up. Uh, it, it's not that the the cell are two and one cell. It's how many. It's how many many things. It's the many to many relationship variables. So some if it's a one. Okay, in my example I said before. Let's say we have three variables A, B, and C. And if it's a, um, if each variable here then on the A column uniquely identifies, so you have A one, A two, A three, A four, and then you have B one, B two, B three, and B six. Uh, that can always extend to my relationship. That losing relationship. The connection. The the idea is it's fairly similar. It also relates to the sheep theory. Yeah, that's that's what I was trying to get at. Sheep theory and also probably different information and also uh, better inequality as well. Right. But if you have, so you have like a family, right? Yeah. In this situation, A1, A2, A3, uh, you can have B1, B1, B2, C1, C2, C2. This, is, this has what's called a unique, uh, a, a unique uh, key here, of length one. This situation, you can always split the uh, the ternary <laughs> relation. So then, so, and we, we did this in our BBS article. So you have the same sort of issue. And we're looking at relational complexity. Um, if you just arbitrarily, you know, there is a problem when you, when you just talk about the number of the arrows of the relation, because you could just arbitrarily the field list out with an interesting information. So, one way to do this is to see, one way to test. As a measure of its interact of its of its order, is to split this along the A column. So you have negative A B and A C. Now, if you just project down here, what do you have? Well, keep it bearing in mind that these are sets, so any repetitions are automatically removed. So you have A1, B1, 
A2, um, B1, and A3, um, B2, did the same on this side, A1, A2, A3. Here we go, C1, C2, C3. Now, the now, can you rejoin, this is called uh, equi-join, but you're joining them back on the, on the common dimension here. And of course, the way that you join is you join where these things match. So you only join A that matches the key, A. You just keep going down A, which is this one here. And you do that, put it back together again. You, you find that you'll get the exactly the original. Now, the case where you can't do that is where the key is here is where the key is actually uh, longer. You may or may not be able to do it. Uh, an example would be said you have A1, uh, B1, C, C1, uh, A, B2. B2, B1. Um, oh, let's, let's see how it goes. I'm now trying to do the same side of the trick. You, you see that there's a different kind of interaction because A here, A1 now, no longer unique indexes for the rows. Because A1 here, if, if you look at A1, actually there are two A1s here and so there are two rows. So when you try and split it, like A1, B1, uh, A1, and B2, to B1, and you split on this side, A1, C1, A1, C2, and C2. C2. And then you try and rejoin them uh, along the A again. And what you find is that this one here pairs with this one, and it also pairs with this one. Uh, and what you end up with having too many pairs. So uh, you'll get back a, a row that no longer appears in the original. Maybe this one here. Yeah, let's get this one here. We have A1, uh, B1, and then C2. So, so but this pair here. Uh, doesn't appear. Oh, actually, does it? The second one is A one B two, right? Yeah. And then A yeah, one B one C. Yeah. So, so this, this row, this row doesn't appear in here. So therefore, it's, you can't split. Something like so that. So there's a higher order interaction. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we say. The reason why it's important in relation to database theory is that if you if you just put everything in every table, when you when uh, some of these are supposed to be the same, so you get you get down to the integrity problem uh, when you update one location, but you don't update it in the other other locations. That's why you want to reduce everything else. Minimal. Anyhow, that's the that's the idea where even though it's two terminal locations. The actual informational complexity here is actually low. Uh, this can be actually split into these two binary relations without loss, losing information about this one. Yeah. Uh, can, may or may not. <clears throat> uh, and this actually relates to the sheaf theory. Uh, so. <laughs> right, yes, yeah. so this also going to be related to the top loss? Well, yeah, sheaf is It's <laughs> Yeah, but so if you can stay away, <laughs> Alex, you might want to join their talk as well. If you don't, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, this, this one is more concrete. But this idea has uh, been around for since eighties in relation to others. What's interesting is uh, Rand's producing this idea in his paper. Ten uh, to link to the relation of this and as a sort of whole of um, sheets, different appreciation. Oh, Japanese sheet speakers, my conversation in Ken Roman C has a continuation in Horizon is very much. So, to get back to the other guys, the original, yes, you do need sometimes you do need the higher interactions. Uh, I'm sorry, finally, was it you can. I was saying, for the beast, you can 
convert this binary relation as you just think of this one variable, a, b, sorry, and then um, this is just binary relation. That could be binary. In, in relational databases, for example, what's called a relational database scheme, you, you write some a binary relation something like this. Okay, here is your a's, here are your b's, here is the table of data that sits on there. But what, you, what you do is you call what's called nested relations. So this then becomes its own node, which you see here. So what you have here is really a table, a binary table, but sitting inside this binary table are pairs. And that's why um, this, this equivalence between binary and pyramid. If you do it by nesting or recursion or induction. So but if you say all this equivalent, um, is there any loss of equation at all or no loss of equation at all? No, look, uh, in this situation, no loss. In, in general? Uh, well, it's an equivalence. So there's always, when equivalence, you always lose some information. Right. Uh, for example, if we have an equivalence class, Let's say, for example, you can, you can talk about the, you can go from the natural power in abstract, it's going to go from the natural numbers to the uh, integers using the equivalence classes. Um, well, there are these fundamental ones. You want C2, C3, and so forth. Now, you can talk about, talk about a representative of this. Now, if you're talking about the entire class, okay, um, we don't know what. Element you're specifically talking about here. So you, there is some. <clears throat> so, we, or for example, if you use the representative of the equivalence class, we treat this as the same as all these other ones, but in reality, underneath that, there are yeah, different. So, it, it just comes down to whether or not you're interested in the, in the member or the uh, class itself. Mm. Uh, I, I interested in a particular way as that. As the equivalence class or red line. Yeah, but you know, also for the, 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 the original question was that whether there is any way, well, so when, when there is a particular program that we try to answer, and then like Alex identified this is two neuron brain or even one neuron can never be described by simple binary description. Uh, description. Okay. Yeah, according to him, uh, his formulation, you know, hypergraph, what actually uh, uh, representation can describe that. In, is there any kind of uh, situation where this uh, nested binary representation cannot deal with the real actually? It needs a bit more context. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It needs a bit more context to, yeah. in, in, of the situation. Yeah. What kind of one? But for example, any any um, surjective function, or any any function that goes from say here down to here, it chooses an equivalence class. All the points here, so you get your x's come out of going to be your y and come out of Now, this uh, this uh, element here produces an equivalence class. All all the x's such that such that. Um, f and x equals one. Okay. You a whole bunch of these. Okay. So that's the first class. That's the first class. Now, what, what I mean is, uh, is there any straight? Well, if you're only focusing on here and you've forgotten it, of course you lose loss of information. But if you maintain this activity here, you not get that. So it needs, it needs some context in advance to answer the question. Yeah, for example, the in the spatial equivalence in general, you can't determine the uh, the star of criminals by four lines. So here is one example. We can't reduce by but in general, we cannot we have yeah. a combination of the minor. It in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. In the same it's it's notion of levels, we're talking about two different levels here. On the left hand side, we're talking about where the, the baseline of all the actions. Second case, you know, we're, we're two levels here, some actions, some pairs. 
Yeah. Yeah, but the, it, especially when we are interested, uh, partially um, in the lives. Yeah, so I have the what I say uh, is that in the same way, for example, that Kim Ram said, uh, for example, the uh, example, uh, but uh, if you consider the two level, uh, like, like uh, elemental subsets, the three things can be considered as one thing instead. And uh, this belongs to this is a binary relationship. So if you allow the multi level, then you can do binary uh, things, express the many binary things. But, but if you allow this, I, I think it is from, it is not how to say what's uh, originally would be it's different. Mathematically, in this sense, you can reduce the binary uh, reduce the many things. Also, it is a different, different um, question, and a different answer to the different question. And the original question, or the original question, is this, um, of course, the, um, there is many things which can be Okay. All right, uh, Alex, do you have any other comments or question? Well, that was great. That was exactly what I hoped. I, I didn't catch everything. The, the, uh, the sound quality wasn't sufficient, but what I caught is very helpful. I want to thank everybody. And you already have, have tabs popped up with cumulants, and, and this is very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs>